Just do the light then, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah.
I can't just say yeah. mine is screaming the truth from the screen. It's not like <laughs> having to present it reasonably. <laughs> Back it up with all the stats. When I was nervous for my first job interview, someone said to me, being nervous just means you care about it. Get started? Yeah. 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 I start, so I need to hand it to me. I can. I need it. Okay. I can. You don't need it. No, I don't need it. If someone asks you okay. what you can do. Alright. Then you know occasion. I don't know I don't need a prompt. You don't need a prompt. In front and to my side. We're all here. All comrades. Yeah, get cozy. Alright. We didn't decide who was going to chair today, so we got to the <laughs> I wonder who. Um, th thanks for coming along, folks. Um, before we begin, of course, we'll acknowledge that we're in the land of the Waitakere Moongar people. We pay respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Um, and commit ourselves to the cause of Indigenous justice in this country, um, which we still have a long way to go. All right, so today's topic is a Green New Deal and what could it mean for Australia? Um, and anyone who's been sort of Following this kind of space, we'll know that there's lots of discussion about the Green New Deal or Green New Deals going on in the United States, and Britain in particular. Um, and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, of course, depends what's in the Green New Deal, I suppose. So that's our speakers are going to, going to explore those themes, I hope, I presume, and and then and use that as a basis for us discussing how will, how how can we advance in Australia this idea of a transition towards a sustainable future that improves everybody's lives. Um, <coughs> make society a better place for all of us. So we've got three speakers, and I think we're going to take them uh, Dirk first, I believe. And I, and I think Dirk is going to primarily address um, the manifestations of Green New Deal, or the forms of Green New Deal that have emerged in the United States, um, and issues emerging. Uh, Rob McKenzie on um, the program being elaborated by Jeremy Corbyn and British Labor. Um, and Katrina Hart is going to share with some ideas about how um, we can take the best of those things and transpose them to Australia and you know, start creating you know, a vision for a transformation in Australia. So um, and there's going to be a bit of uh, video footage and clips and that sort of stuff. So I'll probably leave just Dirk to, to run that because he knows what's what's queued up, how and when. Um, so thanks to you, thanks to our speakers, and we'll start with Dirk. I, I should just say that the speakers will each go for about 15 minutes each and then we'll have time for discussion. So, I'm uh, Dirk. Thank you, Sam. Hi, everyone. I'm Dirk Kelly. Uh, I live here in Perth with my wife. Um, but for about the last 10 years, I've lived in America. So, I'm here today to talk about the Green New Deal from the context of the United States, um, the people involved in it there, what it, the policies are so far, and what we can do going forward from there. Um, so, firstly, I know we all here recognize this, but Climate change is a disaster that is facing all of human life. Um, the IPCC report, which came out in 2018, which is a coalition of scientists from around the world, backed by the United Nations, along with a few other organizations, has stated that climate change represents an urgent and potentially irreversible threat to human life. So the solution, a solution proposed to that has been the Green New Deal, but the question that we really have to ask and that we're going to be asking today is, what is the Green New Deal? And the first thing to understand is that there are many, many Green New Deals. Um, so the Green New Deal overall is a proposal about um, how we take on climate change, how we evolve our society to about to affect change. <laughs> um, so it's essentially a proposal for tackling climate change. Um, and I'm just going to be summarising one proposal um, and then how we can go on from there. Um, that proposal is referred to as the green print for a new deal. Um, it was created by Data for Progress back in 2018. Um, it's been used as a backer for a few different proposals. Um, and I'll just go through the four different aspects of it. So the first aspect is transforming to a low carbon economy. So essentially what that means is 
changing the way that we get energy in society. So firstly, focusing on clean and renewable energy, um, with the proposal being to get to 100% clean and renewable energy by 2035. Now in the past, there's been other Green New Deals that are proposed doing that by 2020 and 2025 and 2030. So um, we'll see that number change depending on which Green New Deal we're looking at, but the facts remain the same. We need to transition away from uh, fossil fuels from the uh, sources of energy that are creating the greenhouse gases, the greenhouse pollution, um, and we need net zero net emissions by 2050. Uh, the next topic is energy efficiency, so how we utilise that energy that's produced. Right now we have a lot of wastage uh, through our housing, through our transportation, through everything. So utilising energy in a far more efficient manager, manage, Matt, anyway, in a far more efficient manner. Um, and transportation. So this is a big factor of uh, climate of energy usage, the way that we get around. Uh, obviously we live in a society that really values the use of car and promotes people, one person in one car driving around a lot. Um, so the proposals come out with 100% zero emission tra uh, pedestrian uh, uh, passenger vehicles um, and 100% fossil, uh, fossil free transportation by 2050. So that's transforming to a low carbon economy. Um, clean air and clean water need to be a right. So the two most valuable resources that we rely on as a species and as life on earth are, is clean air and clean water. Um, climate change does severely affect that. Greenhouse emissions affect our air um, and pollution is destroying our water. In America, there are big infrastructural problems. So I'm sure some of you have heard about lead pipe issues and just the drinkability of water. Um, I don't have the exact stats on me, but they're looking at like somewhere that between 20% at least of cities in America not having drinkable water. Um, that issue also affects the US military itself. Uh, bases in the US don't have clean water. Uh, so it's a real infrastructural problem. So this green print for New Deal, as well as other green New Deal proposals in America, do really have to focus on the infrastructure issues in America. There's a lot of crumbling infrastructure that came out of what was referred to as the New Deal, which I'll actually be getting into a little bit in the, in the, uh, in the near future. Um, restoring the American landscape. So the effects of society on America um, over the last 250, 300 years uh, have been devastating. Uh, and if anything is going to be saved, it needs to be saved now. Uh, forests, uh, they're talking about reforesting 40 million acres of land. Um, wetlands, 5 million acres of wetlands, you know, basically these really important air, uh, environmental areas of America need to be not only saved, but then restored from where they're at. Uh, changing farming so that we use more sustainable farming solutions. Uh, a lot of American farming is big agriculture. So it's a lot of large farms run by corporations that just do mass farming efforts using a lot of pesticides, using a lot of um, chemicals to try to undo the effects of mass farming. We need to really reapproach the way that we do farming. And I know there are a few permaculture people here in the room. Um, obviously that's a way of looking at it, uh, but how do we transform the way that we produce food and utilize the land that we have left? Uh, and in America, uh, some brownfields and hazardous sites. So a brownfield in America is a nice way of saying a piece of land that's been destroyed by economic activities and is now no longer usable. Um, so there needs to be efforts to clean those up. There's also something in America called a, um, a super uh, a super fun site. So that is a site that is so destroyed, toxic, um, radioactive that it needs federal funding in order to resolve the issues. Uh, there are many of them all across the country. Uh, even in New York City, there are riverways that people live alongside, which are toxic riverways that you cannot go into. Uh, and these, these are right next to where people live. Um, and thirdly, uh, or fourthly rather, urban sustainability and resilience. So as our populations grow, and as opportunities for people outside of cities continue to get demolished, people are moving into cities more and more to live. These cities are generally around water areas, areas that are gonna be affected by climate change through uh, sea level rises, but also through uh, air quality and just livability. So how do we transform urban areas to 
not just be these food deserts where people and economic activity lives, where everything is imported, and transform them into areas that produce our own energy, produce their own food, and are just more sustainable and more resilient to the effects of climate change. So those are four of the areas that some of the Green New Deals in America focus on. And I just want to re-emphasize that, that there is no single Green New Deal. However, there are very progressive candidates in America pushing for legislative Green New Deals. And I'd like to talk about that now. So who is fighting for a Green New Deal in America? Um, the first person I want to talk about is a very new and upcoming uh, political face, Alexandria. Ocasio-Cortez uh, is a US congressperson as of this year. Um, so previously she was a bartender, which is amazing. Um, and she stepped up and she ran for Bronx in New York and won by a landslide, um, unseating an incumbent Democratic position that had just been doing nothing for the community. She's a very community-focused activist, uh, very known in her local area. Um, and very loud. She's fantastic. She really is pushing for change. Before she even sat as a congressperson, so after she won her election, but before she sat back in 2018, she joined a bunch of activists who did a sit-in at Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi being the head of the Democratic Party in the US, a sit-in in her office to demand for a Green New Deal. Many of those activists were arrested. AOC stood there engaged with them, created social media content to push that message forward. And that is a really important point of AOC. She's a younger person who is very engaged in technology and understands how to utilize social media to take a message that works locally but can resonate internationally, nationally. Um, so as a congressperson, um, she put forward House Resolution 109 which is um, recognizing the duty of the federal government to create the Green New Deal. So this is an official piece of legislation that now sits in the House in America. She had 67 co-sponsors, um, and this is pushing for the things that I talked about earlier, um, along with more things. So, so what has happened as a result of putting out this proposal is this has created a basis for politicians who are engaged in the topic to take that, explain that, and also provide additional things on top of it. Just in the last two weeks, um, she's been involved in a proposal to uh, create a bunch of uh, housing for low-income people um, that is both affordable but also uh, sustainable, provides food and uses like low um, energy and also a lot of renewable energy. Um, she's also a member of something called the Democratic Socialists of America. Now, I myself have been a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. They are a, they're not so much a party, they're a group of people who engage locally to attempt to make the Democratic Party more left. So their position is that America is a duality, it's really just a two-party country. Um, there are other parties, but because of the media landscape and because of the culture of the country, they never really talked about. So the DSA works to push the Democratic Party to the left, and AOC is gone now and is a Democratic person pushing the party to the left. Um, she's involved in a group called the Gang of Four, which is her along with three other um, Democratic Congress people, uh, Congresswomen actually, who are uh, looking to push these policies. Um, the next person I want to talk about is Bernie Sanders, which I'm sure you have all heard about. Bernie Sanders is a long-standing uh, US Senator, uh, politician. He um, was the mayor of Vermont for decades. Um, who has been pushing for fixing the eco-disaster that we've been living in for centuries, uh, de centuries decades, it's not that old. Um, he is a co-sponsor of Senate Resolution 59. So where we had House Resolution 109, we have Senate Resolution 59. They are the same resolutions. So together they've been, they've been pushed forward into the two part seats of government to recognise the federal government must create a Green New Deal. Bernie Sanders is also running for president in 2020, and he ran for president in 2016. Now, in America and in the American landscape of politics, the president is very important to how what policies are discussed and what is recognized as a doable thing. The president is meant to sort of represent the position of the people. Now, we can always call into question how that is possible. As socialists, we understand that that can't really be a top-down thing. It needs to be a bottom-up perspective of what the people want. 
And that is Bernie Sanders' campaign. So what he is doing differently to every other Democratic candidate out there is he is running on a campaign of us, not me. I've been at one of his rallies where when you chant Bernie, 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 he's like, no, 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 you, you, you. <laughs> and and that, is, that is what he did in 2016. So in 2016, he lost, right? It was devastating. I was there. It hurt a lot of people. But he only lost within the game that you're being told to pay attention to. What he did as a result of the 2016 campaign was created something called Our Revolution. So Our Revolution was a framework focused on local all the way up politics. How do you get involved in your school board? How do you get involved in your local council, in your House of Representatives, in your Senate? He created the inspiration that took young people off the sidelines, made them get up and vote, firstly, um, <coughs> but also get involved in politics. AOC, along with Rashida Taleb, um, Ilana Omar, other women involved in the uh, Gang of Four I was talking about, came from that Our Revolution, recognised that they can get involved in politics at a much more local level to them and push for the same pieces of change that Bernie Sanders is talking about. And that's a really important thing to recognise with Sanders. Uh, it's very possible he won't win the election, um, and I'll get into that more in a minute. Uh, but what we need to recognise is what he's trying to do is change the landscape, is to change the culture, and to change the change the window of conversation that's allowed. Another very important figure, and this gets into what I was talking about with the two-party system, Dr. Jill Stein is uh, a politician who's in the Green Party of the US, and you would be forgiven for not realising that there was a Green Party in the United States. Um, she ran as presidential candidate in 2012 and 2016, and she actually ran on a Green New Deal. So when we talk about what I showed you earlier, that 2018 um, green print for a new deal, Jill Stein had a Green New Deal plan decade, a decade before that. Um, and very importantly, Jill Stein's and the, the Green Party in America's position as a Green New Deal is anti-capitalist, it is anti-imperialist. It states that what needs to happen for a just transition is that America needs to stop plundering the rest of the world. America needs to stop focusing on only America. If we're going to have this transition, it needs to be a global transition. America needs to cooperate with everyone and not try to lead them. Um, and you'll see that now in the 2020 debates with the Democratic candidates. Uh, Mariana Wilson, Williamson was a candidate who uh, said that America was going to be the best at climate change and that when she becomes president, she's going to call the Prime Minister of New Zealand and tell her that America's going to do way better at climate change than New Zealand. That's the culture. That's the, that's the underlying thesis of the country is that we're the best and the way to succeed is to have a leader who can help us be the best. And as we all probably around this room understand, tackling climate change is not a one person problem, it's not a one country problem, it's a global problem. And we all need to be cooperating, not challenging each other on this. So those are three candidates and obviously it's a massive landscape and there are a lot of other candidates out there, but I don't wanna get bogged down in that. What I wanna talk about is what is needed beyond the current efforts. So we have AOC, Bernie Sanders, and Jill Stein, and all these others. What do we need to do beyond it? Well, the first thing to recognize is where this term, the Green New Deal, comes from. The New Deal was a result of the economic collapse in America, the Dust Bowl crisis, uh, the effects of World War I. Um, FDR, the president at the time, created a proposal called the New Deal, which was meant to be a relief for unemployment, a recovery of the economy, and a reform of the financial system. It did all this within the context of a capitalist solution. So what it actually succeeded in doing was protecting capitalism during a time of mass crisis by sort of releasing the tension, you know, giving people work, giving people money, but ensuring that control of the country remained in the hands of the few. So the New Deal squashed socialism. And this here is a little bit of a quote from an article in the Hoover Institute. The Hoover Institute is a very far right capitalist think tank in America that praises how the New Deal squashed socialism. So in their own words, they state how good the, green, the New Deal was for them as capitalists because it took that anger, it took that energy, that fight against what was going on and pushed it into an economic reform that didn't change capitalism. It just created jobs and created business opportunities for people to take control of more of American infrastructure. Um, so it really did crush the opportunity for a third party revolution, for a socialist revolution in America. So 
The Green New Deal must be socialist. When analysing all of these New Deal presentations uh, or solutions or you know, proposals that we get, we need to be looking at it as an anti from an anti-capitalist perspective. We need to be looking at it from an anti uh, an anti-growth perspective and from an anti-imperialist perspective. We can't, as I said earlier, have a Green New Deal that is focused on saving capitalism. Capitalism is the cause of the climate catastrophe. Centralised ownership of all wealth people making decisions based on what will make them money is what has caused the problems that we're living through. And they will come to us with solutions. We will have big oil. We will have, well, Tesla come along and say that we're gonna create electric cars that are gonna save the future. Well, what happened to Tesla's stock after the coup in Bolivia? Tesla is just green capitalism. It's just green imperialism. It's just another way of doing the same, but with a different piece of branding on top of it to make people feel good about it, while the same problems still occur outside of the American landscape. Sanders needs to take this on, and if Sanders doesn't take this on, the follow-up from Sanders needs to take this on. Um, it needs to be recognised that the Democratic Party, the party that Sanders and AOC is working within, is in no way democratic. The 2016 elections were rigged. The, there are two sets of elections in America. There's the primary election and the presidential election. The primary election, which is what's happening right now for 2020, and it's a very long and arduous and horrible experience to watch, but the two parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, have elections for who is gonna represent that party. In 2016, the Democratic Party was broke they turned to Hillary Clinton for funding. Hillary Clinton gave them funding in return for having all control over how the Democratic Party selected the Democratic representative. The WikiLeaks exposure just before the Democratic National Convention really gets into the details of how this worked. Um, the Democratic Party worked with news sources to ensure that Sanders was never talked about. The Democratic Party itself slandered Sanders and you know, attacked him instead of actually providing that opportunity for it. And then during the convention, the election of the, the person comes from the delegates of the different states. So there are a bunch of elections before that that have the decision of which state people want to go with. But then there are people who are allocated as superdelegates. Those people then present not the position of the state, but their position, taking into consideration the position of the state. So superdelegates for states that voted for Sanders voted for Clinton. Now, I understand that my state wanted Sanders, but I don't want Sanders, I want Clinton. Those people were people who previously worked in Clinton campaigns, previously worked for the DNC, essentially were Clinton representatives. So the Democratic Party was sued um, their lawyers turned around and said, look, we're a private organisation. I don't care what our constitution says, we can do whatever we want. Try to sue us, we'll do it again. And they are doing it again. We see it now in the 2020 election. Um, I mean, it's crazy to watch. The television stations will be showing the 20 candidates that the Democrats currently have, and they'll just accidentally leave Bernie Sanders off the polling. And mm. it's, it's, it's crazy and it's in your face, but it's in your face because they know that they can get away with it because the Democratic Party is not democratic. It's a private organization that gets to decide who the A of the A and B option is for the American people. Even if Bernie Sanders wins the presidential position as the Democrats, that doesn't mean that the Democrats in the House or the Senate will support Bernie Sanders. He can come along and say, okay, cool, I'm president now, we're doing a Green New Deal. And they can say, yeah, but we're not gonna vote through anything. And they will and they have in the past. We saw this with Obama. We saw uh, Obama came into power with full support of the Democratic Party, and the Democratic Party decided to not push forward any of the proposals that were voted for, and Obama decided to not push forward any of the proposals that he wanted, uh, or said he wanted. So the Democrats will not support Bernie Sanders if he does get into power. Now, that is undermined by the Our Revolution efforts. That is undermined by having people like AOC, Ilhan Omar, Rashid Talib in, in positions of power in the House and the Senate. Um, and we are seeing more and more success. We just had our 2018 elections for a lot of those positions. And I can say that quite a few socialists got through um, as Democrats. So that there is a ray of hope 
that those levers of power will include people who are committed to the Green New Deal should Bernie Sanders get through. But we don't know that and we can't guarantee that and it's a complicated game. So to trust the Democrats full on is a hazy issue. And for that, you know, there will be discussions of the third party, you know, should Sanders have launched a third party after the loss during 2016 is questionable. Was the right effort to create this caucus of people who are now getting involved in the levers of power to at least test this opportunity? Potentially that's good. We don't know. You know, but going forward, we have to be thinking about these things. Um, as mentioned, you know, the Green the Green Party has been around for decades, and you've never heard of them, and that's part of the system. Um, so, that's just my small synopsis analysis of the US. Um, I'm sure not everyone here is interested and, and should be interested in what's going on in the US. I'm happy to take that and, and make that the thing that I do with all my time. Um, but where can you find out more? If you are online, so is AOC, she's very online. Um, and she's really showing us how we should be expecting our elected representatives to behave online. Um, she treats her, AS, her Twitter very seriously, it's her Twitter. She tweets, her staffers don't tweet. Um, she considers her social media to be her voice and her way of connecting with people that she can't meet with face to face. And I think that's fantastic. Um, Capitalism has not always existed in the world and will not always exist in the world is one of her positions. So these people getting in are not pro-capitalist. They are socialist. The, the, the talking points inside America don't really allow for that, but they are still pushing for that. And you'll see how actively attacked she is over that, but still she's out there fighting. Someone I wanna, wanna mention that doesn't get a lot of mention in the world um, is Dr. Richard Wolf. If you're interested in actual analysis of the news in America from a socialist perspective, Dr. Richard Wolf is your man. Um, he runs the economic update through uh, democracyatwork.info. He's a Marxist economist who has a BA from Harvard, an MA from Stanford, an MA from Yale, and a PhD from Yale. He's a Marxist economist who is within the circles of power, Definitely off on the side because he is a Marxist, but when things happen in the Federal Reserve, those things happened after, you know, he sat through lunches where he listened to those people talk about that. So he does provide an excellent weekly 30 minutes just rundown of what's happened in America and the world from a Marxist perspective. 15 minutes at the end of it is devoted to uh, meeting with someone who is involved in local life activities. So for 30 minutes a week, you can be getting a really good rundown of what's going on in America from an actual anti-capitalist perspective. Um, he also supports David Harvey, which I'm sure a few people here have heard that name and know who he is. Uh, he's now doing the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles as well as Readings of Marx uh, Capital, which is pretty fantastic because we need more and more of those <laughs> sort of bite-sized understandable chunks. Um, Global Capitalism Live Economic Update is another bi-monthly thing where he meets uh, at a, he goes to a church in New York City where he can get a big congregation of people around and does a, a two-monthly update of what's been going on. And that goes for about two hours, that's also really good. Um, capitalism Hits Home is uh, interviews that he does with a psychologist who does a lot of work on like how capitalism affects people at home, relationships, our life, how it really sits into everything that we, we live through. Um, and he also uh, has Puerto Rico Goes Forward is a group of people that every month report on Puerto Rico, which is a, uh, a non-state member of the United States that doesn't get any sort of coverage at all, but is trying to fight for a socialist revolution. Uh, I also want to plug BreadTube slash LeftTube. Um, this is, uh, like full disclosure, this is a website that I work on, uh, but it is a way of collating media from across the world that is anti-capitalist. Um, breadtube.tv is the website now it's just a website that lists and it's sort of out of date at this point but what is there is the channels of people who are creating content and there are some amazing people around the world who are really fighting for change through content um, and that's really it if you want any more information I too am way online um, I spend too much time caring about America um, researching the US to Australia propaganda pipeline um, I'm willing to give myself brainworms using Twitter um, and I'm happy to field questions and uh, provide resources for anyone who's interested in what's going on in America. So that's my little analysis of a big country. Uh, pass it over. Oh. Uh, thanks, Derek. No, no, I'd just like to start by 
putting the um, Free New Deal internationally into some sort of um, international perspective. With the aid of John Bellamy Foster, the um, American eco-socialist, he says that the Green New Deal coalesces the movement to arrest climate change with the struggle for economic and social justice focusing on the effects of climate change on workers and frontline communities. He warns us to be mindful of who is pushing the Green New Deal and why, because it will have a class character. Will it identify the culprit as capitalism or does it add to the greenwashing which accompanies the rise of the climate emergency movement? And Bellamy Foster says that the Green New Deal strategies now being advanced are revolutionary reforms which promise a fundamental restructuring of economic, political and economic and ecological power, pointing towards the transition from socialism to capitalism. Our own Pip Hinman of the Socialist Alliance warns the sectarian left deems any talk of a GMD as capitulation to reformism. I've seen a lot harsher things on left-wing websites on that, saying it's all you know, being run by the corporates, etc., etc., and that Britain is completely a, a corporate shield, and so on and so forth. But Pip Hinman says transition, transitional measures designed by socialists to help mobilise pays to help mobilise people, thereby raises consciousness and puts forth an anti-capitalist solution. In this regard, to take an analogy, um, socialists do not oppose Medicare. Um, we don't oppose Medicare. I think the left sectarian view of Medicare would be that because it makes life slightly easier for the working class, that just delays the adoption of socialism. Therefore, we should be against Medicare, which is self-defeating. Now, Medicare is a step on the way towards a, a social solution to um, national problems. Pippin says a militant mass movement is needed to push capitalist governments into radical measures. And I think that's the clue behind the success so far of the um, Green New Deal movement within the British Labour Party. Because the Green, Left New, sorry, the Green New Deal is a grassroots campaigning group of young Labour members. At the recent Labour Party conference, it secured the support of nearly all major unions. Laura Townsend, trade unionist and spokesperson for Labour for a Green New Deal, told the conference, environmental breakdown is a class issue which requires working class solutions. The Labour movement has voted to take leadership on the climate emergency with a response which puts people and planet before profit. Now the ambition has been set and it's time for our movement to come together to put a Green New Deal from the ground up in every town, village and city. At the Labour conference in September, delegates overwhelmingly voted for two motions banging the GND. One motion included a target for the UK to achieve net zero emissions by 2030. One, however, did not, calling for the UK to act as a world leader on climate change and establish a national climate service. That second resolution was put forward by the GND union, uh, which, employed, which represents a lot of workers in the fossil fuel industry and also the um, nuclear power industry. But, Interestingly enough, both of those resolutions, although somewhat in conflict with each other, were passed <laughs> by big majorities. But the fact that they were in conflict with each other at least gives the Labour leadership under Corbyn a certain amount of wiggle room, which they have used, I must say. It's also no coincidence that the vote occurred a few days after the mass conversions on Westminster of many thousands of school children demanding action on climate change. That brings into focus again the need for a, a bottom-up mass movement to achieve the results. You wouldn't get uh, the Labour Party, which in a lot of respects is still a very, very conservative organisation, adopting a Green New Deal if there hadn't been this tremendous pressure from below. And that's a, a lesson that we need to take to heart. And also getting the support of most of the unions. Well, a couple of days ago, Labor's manifesto for the 2019 election 
came out. Uh, it's called a Green Industrial Revolution, or the Green New Deal, a Green Industrial Revolution. In tribute, as it were, to the Industrial Revolution in Britain, which started in the mid 18th century, um, which brought us things like the steamship, the railways, the electric telegraph, etc., a great deal more. Taking an overview, its aim is to achieve a substantial majority of Labor's emission reductions and emissions by 2030. So you can see there, they've stepped back a bit from having zero net emissions by 2030, and they're saying we're going to achieve a substantial majority of our emissions reductions by 2030. The UK is to be on track for a net of zero carbon energy system within the 2030s. So perhaps delaying the desired outcome by a few years. The Greens, incidentally, the Green Party wants zero net emissions by 2030. Also promised as part of the overall aim is the creation of 20 million climate jobs across all nations and regions in the UK. Interesting to note that a majority of voters, according to a YouGov poll, uh, back the 2030 deadline for zero net emissions. Equally interestingly, nearly 50% of Tory voters back the 2030 deadline for zero net emissions. And only 16% of Tory voters back their own party's target of 2030. <laughs> so, so as in a number of other areas like um, nationalisation of the railways, you know, Tory voters are way ahead of their own party. Because Tory voters also back nationalisation of the railways. Okay, the, quite frankly, the um, manifesto is, is very comprehensive and, you know, I, on the whole, you know, quite revolutionary. Quite, I don't think anything like this has been put forward by a political party in a, in a Western country ever, in terms of that. The only um, parallel in terms of, um, you know, sweeping changes would have been Labor's own 1945 manifesto which was called Let Us Face the Future, and led to the National Health Service, and the Welfare State, et cetera, et cetera, all those other advances. Well, this statement, this statement goes something like this. This election is about the crisis in living standards and the climate and environmental emergency. We must confront this change while dealing with the growing inequality and insecurity in Britain. The Green Industrial Revolution will create one million jobs to transform industry, energy, transport, agriculture and buildings. There will be lower energy bills and whole new industries to revive neglected parts of the country. Very important that. Labor will work in partnership with the workforce and the trade unions. You'll find throughout this uh, manifesto that the trade unions are called upon to play a very significant role. A more equitable and enlightened economy that protects the environment, reigns in corporate power, revitalizes democracy, unites communities, builds international solidarity, and promises a better quality of life for all. General objectives. In particular, investment. The proposal is to create a sustainable investment board consisting of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, i.e. the Treasurer, the Business Secretary, the Government Minister, and the Government of the Bank of England to oversee, coordinate and bring forward this investment involving the trade unions and business. There will be an Office for Budget Responsibility to incorporate climate and environmental impacts in its forecasts so that the cost of not acting will be factored into every fiscal decision. There will be a National Transformation Fund of $400 billion. billion. Of this $250 billion will directly fund the transmission to a green transformation fund dedicated to renewable and low carbon energy and transport, biodiversity and environmental restoration. There will be a national investment bank to provide $250 billion of lending for enterprise, infrastructure and innovation over 10 years. We must lend in line with the decarbonising objectives of the plan. Decarbonise the economy, increase productivity and create good jobs. Smaller loans will be available through the new post office bank 
based in post office branches for bottom up changes, leading to small businesses, cooperatives, and community projects. This is an interesting one. Any company that fails to contribute to tackling the climate and environmental emergency will be delisted from the London Stock Exchange. Investment is to be spread evenly across the whole country by giving powers and funding to every region and nation, which is the reverse of what's happened over the last 40 years in Britain, where the regions, particularly the north of England, you know, have been starved of investment, seen their basic industries shut down, uh, see literally millions of people pushed out of uh, decently paid jobs into either unemployment or else low paid service sector jobs. So a complete reversal of that trend contemplated by spreading these investments evenly throughout the country. There'd be a local transformation fund in each English region, as well as um, devolved governments in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, bearing in mind that some of what the British Parliament can legislate for is purely for England, and the regional legislatures in the other parts of the country, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, you know, have their own separate ability to legislate in that regard, in regard to some of these things. There'll be a National Transformation Fund unit, which will be a key part of the Treasury, to be located in the north of England, appropriately enough, <laughs> no doubt for the first time. <coughs> Energy. The United Kingdom is to be on track for net zero carbon energy system within the 2030s. Nearly 90% of electricity and 50% of heat will be from renewable and low energy sources, low carbon sources by 2030. There'll be 7,000 new offshore wind turbines, 2,000 new onshore wind turbines. There'll be enough solar panels to cover 22,000 football pitches. Now, here's one of the nasties that are obviously put in to duplicate, I'd say, the BNG union. Uh, no, new nuclear power needed for energy security. So, they're, they're contemplating the idea that you have to have nuclear power for energy security, and it be new nuclear power. So that's a, that's a negative. Um, maybe, you know, if, if a cool does, government does eventually end up dealing with just quite and forget that one. Um, one of the objectives is to upgrade almost all homes to the highest energy efficient standards. Labor will support energy workers through transition and guarantee them retraining and a new unionised job on equivalent <coughs> terms and conditions, which addresses quite a lot of union concerns about what would happen from the shutting down of the fossil fuel industry and the nuclear industry and the nuclear power industry. There'll be a windfall tax on oil companies. Ownership. Energy and water systems to be bought into democratic public ownership. Utilities will not be run from Whitehall, but by service users and workforces. There'll be a new UK National Energy Agency, which will own and maintain the national grid, infrastructure, and oversee delivery of decarbonisation targets. Industry and innovation. For three decades, the UK has reduced its emissions at the expense of domestic industry by offshoring production. There will be a committee on climate change to assess the emissions that have been exported, as well as those that the nation produces and recommend policies to tackle them. In terms of skills, the revolution will create at least one million well-paid unionised jobs. Labour will train people. Transport. Cutting emissions will drive Labour's transport policies. Local councils will be able to regulate bus services and take them into public ownership if it wants to. Take, it, take into control and ownership bus networks. They don't have to, but they'll be given the power to do so. In such cases where councils do take ownership of bus networks, there will be free bus travel for the under 25s. They'll reinstate 3,000 bus routes that have been cut, and the railways will be returned to public ownership uh, 
which will be achieved by taking railway companies back into public ownership once their franchises expire. The private railway operators are operating franchises for a fixed period of time. Once those franchises expire, uh, the government takes them back into ownership. It's not quite clear how much of these things in terms of you know, trains and carriages and freight wagons and so on that the government will own. Uh, that's something that doesn't seem to have been fleshed out. There will be an end to driver operated home trains, which has been very unpopular uh, because of the uh, loss of safety, particularly the loss of assistance for disabled people using trains. So they'll end that. They'll implement a full rolling program of electrification of the rail system. Electrification of the railways was supposed to be one of the uh, projects on the modernisation plan in 1955, which saw the crazy gradual phasing out of steam. Uh, the idea was that diesel power on the railways was to be an interim gesture, to be followed by rapid electrification. In actual fact, you know, the electrification program slowed right down. The West Coast Main Line was electrified, some other electrification projects, but you know, by and large, most of the railways remain steam before, which is very uh, carbon emitting. Electrification, full electrification you know, is obviously needed to, to eliminate that or to minimise it. The State Railway Company will coordinate mainline upgrades. There will be a completion of the full high speed rail to route to Scotland, another high speed rail up through uh, eastern England to Scotland. And very interestingly, in consultation with local communities, branch lines will be reopened undoing the terrible work done by um, Dr. Beeching in the 1960s who closed down a whole lot of branch lines, thereby making himself the most unpopular man in Britain, I might add. <laughs> in terms of uh, land use planning, there'll be increased funding to promote cycling and walking. So the aim is obviously to make people less reliant on their cars, get people walking, cycling, using public transport, um, that sort of thing to stop you know, anything to get people out of the cars. However, um, there's something in the program which has been criticised by environmental groups as greenwashing. They say there's an aim to end new sales of combustion engine vehicles by 2030, but then invest in electrical vehicle in charging, electrical vehicle in charging infrastructure. The point about that is that you have to have electricity obviously to charge your electric vehicle. Most of the electricity is produced by the combustion of, um, of gas, okay, which obviously emits carbon. So simply by having electric cars, you don't get rid of carbon out of this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a that's something that's a bit of a flaw in the whole thing. Mind you, if the overall aim of getting people out of cars succeeds, there will still be you know, a substantial reduction in carbon emissions. In terms of the environment, um, there'll be a new Clean Air Act. Um, there was one in Britain in the 1950s, probably the first in the world. It was a response to the problem of smog in London, which is actually you know, smog being a mixture of smoke and fog, a big death toll every year. Um, so the Clean Air Act in those days got rid of coal fires in domestic homes, you know, coal firing and steam units which were running factories at the time, and so on and so forth. So there'll be a new Clean Air Act with a vehicle scrapping scheme, getting rid of the old bangers, and there'll be clean air zones. There'll be funding of improved flood defences. Um, there'll be a new program of uh, tree planting. Um, there'll be new national parks which will safeguard existing wildlife sites. In terms of land, they'll support environmental land management and sustainable methods of food production. There'll be increased access to those who want to become new entrants into farming. Food. Labour will end Food Bank Britain, 
where thousands of people have to go because they're starving and can't afford to buy food. Um, Labor will introduce a right to food. Not too sure what all that would take, but that's, that's the aim. Um, they want to halve food bank usage within a year and remove the need for food banks within three years. They'll re-establish an agricultural wages board in England. They still have them in the other parts of the UK, but they've been abolished in England. I might add that wages boards were first introduced by Churchill in about 1911 to address the problem of low pay in certain industries. So how retrogressive it was that under probably Thatcherism or Blairism or whatever, the agricultural wages boards were abolished in England. Anyway, they're going to be restored if Labor wins the election. Um, another aim is net zero carbon food production by 2040. In terms of waste and recycling, um, make producers responsible for the full cost of recycling <coughs> and disposal. Build three new recycle, recyclable steel plants, and this is a gesture to the north of England in areas with a history of steel manufacturing. Well, they may not be making steel manufacturing now, but they'll be having a steel recycling plant, maybe. Finally, animal welfare. Um, no fox hunting, which the Tories want to reintroduce, and end the colour badges. Hooray. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Long live the badges. Sorry? Long live the badges. Long live the badges, absolutely. <laughs> and there'll be a, a, a work to end commercial whaling and they'll ban importation of things like uh, rhino horns and elephant tusks. Um, so that's it. Uh, it's all a big if. You know, does Labor win the election? Um, I, I don't know. It's going to be a very uphill job. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of electoral arithmetic against it. But um, maybe I can talk about that later if anyone wants to wants to discuss it. But um, anyway, that's it. That's um, that's Labor's um, Green Industrial Revolution. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, thanks, Heaps, Dirk, and Rob. So we've seen what the UK and the US have to offer, which of course brings us to Australia. And so I guess to start, what better way than? Uh, Dirk's introduced us to you know, wonderful people like Cortez and Ben Sanders. Um, England at least have an opposition party that are trying to stand up to the Tory influence. Whereas we have, <laughs> we do, this is our Prime Minister's response to the climate crisis here in Australia. Oh no, it's like really <coughs> not working. So. Sorry, Trina. That's alright. Uh, <coughs> Any link between Australia's climate change policies and the current bushfires doesn't stand up to reason. <laughs> no kidding. Let's go live now to political reporter no, Trudy McIntosh. Oh, yeah, the well. This is pretty straightforward comments, uh, <laughs> but uh, they seem to create some. Um, a bit of controversy these days. A bit of controversy. The Minister up until now, Chris, as you recall, has been reluctant to weigh into this debate. Last week, as we saw those fires raging in New South Wales, he said it wasn't the appropriate time for politicians to be bickering about whether climate change was having an impact. But today, he has weighed into that debate. He's saying that there's no direct link between Australia's climate policies and the severity of these sorts of fires. He's also added that even if Australia were to increase its emissions, it wouldn't be having a big impact. <laughs> the suggestion that any way, shape or form, Australia uh, accountable for 1.3% of the world's emissions, that the individual actions of Australia are impacting directly on specific fire events, whether it's here or anywhere else in the world, that doesn't bear up to credible scientific evidence either. If to suggest that with just at 1.3% of global emissions, that Australia 
doing something differently, more or less, uh, would have um, changed the fire outcome this season. I don't think that stands up to any credible scientific evidence at all. So that's our Prime Minister's response. Uh, yeah. Did you have the ad there? Yeah. And, and here's a classic example of our media's response as well. <laughs> cheerleader for coal, and who can, of course, forget Scummo bringing his favourite lump of coal into his parliament mm. house. Um, however, we know that science <laughs> has stated that in order to meet the Paris Agreement targets, we would have to shut down 12 coal-powered plants by 2030. Um, instead, Scummo obviously wants to double the coal exports. Um, globally, uh, we heard there Morrison saying that, you know, anything we do is not going to have any effect whatsoever. However, globally, we are the third largest exporter of carbon emissions. Um, investment in clean energy has fallen as government continues to reward fossil fuel industries with billions in subsidies. So that's our Liberal National Party. Now, on the other side, our opposition, Labor. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, barely two weeks ago, I think, the federal ALP finally tabled a motion in the lower house to declare an emergency, um, which only five members showed up to defend. Um, yeah, of the ALP. Um, and of course, in practice, we know that it continues to approve coal and gas projects throughout the country. So we have in Queensland, uh, Labor Premier um, has opted to fast track Adani and open up a development that promises to increase global emissions by 10%. Um, in Victoria, Daniel Andrews, our great lefty Premier, um, is expanding drilling activities offshore in the Otway Basin with no word to continue the current onshore ban of fracking and drilling, which expires next year. Which, of course, brings us to our wonderful mining state, glorious <laughs> mining state of WA, where our emissions, we're actually the only state where our emissions are rising have risen 23% since the baseline 2005 year. Um, so I recently went along to uh, a report by put together by Clean State and the Conservation um, Council. Um, and though I won't, I won't go into all the damning graphs and figures and stats because it's pretty depressing, I would like to read you the, the key findings from this report and take note, this is just WA alone. Um, just to show you what we're kind of up against when we want to put forward a, a, any kind of green deal here in Australia. So uh, this is the first time a report has investigated the full impact of greenhouse gas emissions from WA liquefied natural gas LNG. It investigates domestic pollution generated here in WA from mining and export of LNG and found just two companies, Chevron and Woodside, responsible for the overwhelming majority of runaway pollution that places our Paris commitments in jeopardy. So the first key finding they found, uh, WA LNG pollution is breaching the Paris Agreement. LNG production in WA is the fastest growing pollution source in Australia and has been the primary driver of recent national emissions growth. Australia's international commitment under the Paris Agreement requires pollution to be reduced by 26 to 28% from the 2005 baseline year. But current and proposed LNG projects coming online since 2005 will add 41.6 million tonnes of pollution a year, equivalent to a 61% increase on WA's 2005 emissions baseline and an 8% increase above Australia's 2005 baseline. Second key finding, gas is WA's biggest polluter, dwarfing all other pollution sources. 
The rapid expansion in LNG production in Western Australia, in combination with inadequate carbon pollution controls, has had a dramatic impact on the state's total emissions. While all other states' emissions are falling, WA's have risen by 23% since 2005. Emissions from current WA LNG facilities make up 36% of WA's total annual emissions. If the proposed Woodside Burrup hub expansion is approved, and I heard yesterday, so this expansion they've um, split up into seven different areas. So rather than look at the overall impact of this hub they're proposing, they take one section at a time. And apparently yesterday, the first um, part of this hub expansion has gone quietly, has been approved quietly with no word publicly. Um, so if it's approved, opening up the Browse and Scarborough gas fields, emission from WA's current and proposed LNG facilities will account for 47% of WA's annual emissions. Carbon pollution from Chevron's Wheatstone and Gorgon projects is almost three times more than WA's Mooja power station, which is WA's oldest and dirtiest coal-fired power station. Pollution from WA's five currently operating LNG facilities is so high that Chevron and Woodside are in the top 10 list of Australia's highest emitters. Pollution from WA's current and proposed LNG facilities combined will be as high as the total annual emissions from countries including Ireland, Sweden, Hong Kong and New Zealand. Third key finding, Chevron and Woodside are responsible for most of this pollution and there are no effective controls on their operations. Um, and we've heard several talks, we've had and, and Sam talks about it a lot, uh, about the EPA's recommendations that um, these projects are at least offset by 100%, and we saw um, McGowan's response to that. Within six hours, he um, completely dismissed it. Given the fossil fuel industry, the power to pretty much do what they want, set their own targets. We saw a week of the West Australian, those full page ads, no, this is necessary, jobs and growth, jobs and growth, jobs and growth. This is great for WA. Um, Current controls on carbon pollution from WA LNG projects were found to be completely inadequate. Where conditions have been imposed, they vary and have either not been met or the licence condition has been removed. Uh, the fourth finding, WA LNG pollution cancels out Australia's national efforts to reduce emissions. So the Emissions Reduction Fund, ERF. Over the next 12 years, the total cumulative emissions from WA's five current LNG facilities, 384 million tonnes, will cancel out the entire amount of abatement expected to be delivered under the ERF, 375 million tonnes. At a total cost of 4.55 billion, the ERF is effectively an Australian taxpayer funded offset program for Chevron and Woodside operations in 2031. So all the efforts to create any kind of um, offset of these emissions is totally wiped out by Chevron and Woodside's uh, operations alone. Yeah, that way, and just total emissions in Australia. Um, gas versus renewable energy target. Annual carbon pollution from WA's current LNG projects cancels out the entire pollution savings from all of Australia's renewable energy every year. The renewable energy target of 20% by 2020 covers every solar panel, large solar farm and all wind powered installed in Australia since 2001. It's been described as Australia's largest and most effective carbon abatement policy and is helping us avoid about 26 million tonnes of pollution each year. Yet the level of pollution from WA LNG alone is 12 times the amount we are saving every year with renewable energy in Australia. So basically these two companies alone are pretty much wiping out any attempts we've made to, to offset our emissions, to lower our emissions. Just two companies in WA. Um, gas versus rooftop solar. Annual carbon pollution from WA's five LNG plants 32 million tonnes is almost five times greater than the savings made by every single solar panel across 2.1 million Australian rooftops every year. 20% of Australians' homes now have solar on their rooftops, with over 21 million solar PV systems installed nationwide. Australia's fleet of solar rooftops are generating about 8.5 gigawatts of electricity, which in turn avoids about 6.6 .6 million tonnes of pollution. These savings are dwarfed by the annual emissions from WA LNG. Fifth key finding, offsetting LNG pollutions in WA would create 4,000 jobs. Um, I mean, we're, we're beyond even offsetting emissions. I mean, we know we have to, to stop it completely, but even if we were to try and offset emissions, um, <coughs> it would create jobs. 
So a study commissioned by the CCWA investigated the abatement potential and economic benefits to WA of offsetting direct emissions generated by the LNG industry within the state. It found a potential for 80 million tonnes of emission offsets per year here in WA, offsetting 30 million tonnes per year, an amount just short of the total emissions from WA LNG would create around 4,000 jobs. These new jobs would include tree plantings, large-scale renewable energy, rangeland regeneration and savannah burning activities and would also have significant benefits to WA's natural environment. Um, and the last key finding, uh, there is no such thing as clean gas. So you know, companies like Origin who claim to, to be doing the right thing and claim to be clean gas. Gas is still a fossil fuel and breaks the carbon budget. Elevated methane levels negate any advantage over coal. A major international review of LNG infrastructure found that the threat to climate from LNG is as large or larger than coal. There is no evidence for Australian gas reducing emissions overseas and the concept of burning more fossil fuels to reduce emissions is perverse. Mm -hmm. New gas projects will only lock in another 40 to 60 years of carbon pollution and are highly risky projects that will risk billions of dollars into stranded assets. Large scale, low cost renewables can now displace both coal and gas and complying with the IPCC and Paris Agreement coals means reducing gas, not increasing it. Um, yeah, so <laughs> depressing, but I just thought I needed to read that to, to, to show you what, what we're up against if we even attempt to try and introduce any kind of new Green Deal is, is what, we're up, what we're up against. Um, so obviously the fossil fuel industry has a massive, massive influence over um, our political, our government. And the reason for this is that the mining sector wields um, enormous structural power of the extractive industries. Our economy is heavily reliant on primary exports from raw materials. Mining accounts for 20% of business investment, 60% of exports, and 18% of stock market capital. The mining industry provides stimulus to construction, transport, infrastructure, and is a supplier of key industries such as electricity, cement, and steel. And it's a highly profitable destination for banking investment. So basically, the fossil fuel industry has the power to topple governments, to control governments. I mean, we saw that in the Rudd Gillard government when they tried to introduce even a you know, moderate um, mining tax. Um, and the industry cultivates deep ties with the Australian political class with an army of lobbyists deployed to shape policy at all levels of government. So for example, Australia's lead negotiator for the Kyoto Agreement, Ralph Hillman, later became head of Australia's Coal Association. Mm. <laughs> Phil Shorten's chief of staff, Cameron Miller, became owner of a lobbying company employed by Adani. Mm. Uh, even the former head of the Australian Council of Trade Unions, uh, Martin Ferguson, he now heads the Union Busting Minerals Council of Australia. Mm. Um, so it was funny, at the same presentation of this report, Carmen Lawrence uh, gave a talk and her talk was solely about the insidious power that the, the lobbyists and fossil fuel ha company have over our government. Um, she spoke about just absolute corruption, lack of any transparency, um, there's no records kept of, of who's lobbying, how much they pay, why, what, what the purpose is. Um, there's no obligation to reveal sources of donations. Um, she spoke about the easy access that the uh, CEOs and the lobbyists have to minister, literally they can get them on the phone, you know, 24 hours a day. Um, lunches, dinners, it's, yeah, it's um, insidious. Uh, so depressing as it was, I, I just wanted to see that to, to emphasise just why we desperately, desperately need some kind of new Green Deal here in Australia and, and what we're up against. Um, so what might it look like here then? Um, well, as Dirk said, uh, to avoid climate collapse, we must drastically reduce emissions in only about 10 to 15 years, the science is telling us, 10 to 15 years. So we need a complete social reorganisation on this scale and it won't occur without rapid state intervention into the economy. In other words, we need a complete system change that is anti-capitalist and socially just. A moratorium must be placed on all new coal and gas exploration. Fossil fuel industry basically must be shut down as soon as possible. 
Now, the capitalists will scream, of course, that this will destroy our economy, deprive people of jobs. However, closure of these industries and a transition to renewable energy that involves reskilling workers will create jobs in the numerous occupations that will grow as a result of green investment, such as coal mine rehabilitation, building new infrastructure, developing new technology and training. Uh, abolishing subsidies will reduce global demand, but of course the market alone will not end the industry, and thus a socialist solution of nationalising the mines, the schools, the prisons, public transport, hospitals, electricity grid, appropriating the capital and labour power and redirecting it towards Green New Deal social and economic programs would be necessary. Um, so I just like to read you some words that were written by Dino Barrasso. Um, he wrote an article in Jacobin magazine. Um, this is his vision of how what a new Green Deal should look like. So we need a new Green Deal that not only tackles the immediate problem of rising emissions, but one that also tackles wealth redistribution, providing a genuine synthesis between climate action and social justice. Australia is a country with stagnant wages, high prices and soaring inequality. Imagine instead a country where government subsidise solar panels, re-nationalise energy grid, cut electricity prices to a fraction of their current cost, where free, frequent public transport exists in every corner of the country, where unemployment is drastically reduced through investment into green industries, supplying the population with training, followed by tens of thousands of well-paid, secure and union jobs. The only thing that should go extinct in our time, he says, are the ills of privatisation and labour market insecurity. Such measures would represent a victory over a politics driven by mining companies which have hitherto been riding roughshod over Indigenous rights, sponsoring draconian laws that criminalise protest, and supporting military intervention that steal the natural resources of poor neighbouring countries. Such a Green New Deal could only come about through drastic political change. The same lot of corporations, think tanks, lobbyists, politicians responsible for environmental destruction can also be blamed for stagnating wages, soaring house prices, student debt, wealth inequality, and the privatisation of public services. A Green New Deal that overhauls all this could find ample popularity in Australia. Uh, so what other areas then do we need to look at? Obviously it's not just um, fossil fuels. Um, and like both Dirk and Rob have pointed out, um, transport. Currently transport in Australia accounts for 18% of our national emissions. Under private management, which is provided with <coughs> stacks of cash, again, not only do we subsidise the fossil fuel industries, but um, for example, the Victorian government give Metro trains $800 million a year to run their trains, which are <laughs> late, <laughs> don't go too many places, um, overcrowded, um, and which fail to expand in line with population growth and urban sprawl. We know our government's solution to too many cars on roads is to build more roads, which simply leads to more cars, more congestion. Um, so then our government would suggest we introduce tolls on these roads. However, if we have public transport, which is brought under public control, we could make it free, expand, um, expand it, could minimise reliance on cars, nationalised high-speed rail could reduce the use of truck shipping and airplanes for domestic transport. Um, agriculture. Our current agriculture practices consume huge quantities of fossil fuels, accounting for 15% of gas emissions. We need to reduce flocks of sheep and cattle drastically. I mean, vegans would argue completely. Um, as part of reduction in methane emissions and farming communities should be supported financially with training and resources to make the transition to sustainable, low emission agriculture, increasing carbon storage in soils and ecosystems while maintaining biodiversity. Um, so there's lots of talk, obviously, of just transition. We need to give the mining community retraining, reskilling. We need to um, take the same approach with the agricultural industry. Uh, and forestry, land clearing and old growth logging must end. And native forest, um, it was interesting that Dirk was talking about, um, about the need for, uh, yeah, re regenerating land. Apparently native vegetation in Australia, it stores three times more carbon than, than any other kind of vegetation. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so land clearing and old growth logging must end and native forest 
that spills up to three times more carbon must be revegetated. Food production should be localised to reduce energy needed to refrigerate or transport foods. Our Green New Deal also opens up, could also open up, open up opportunities to address long-standing economic injustices to Indigenous communities. So when people talk about a Green New Deal, we could propose a Black New Deal, which would place Aboriginal land in Aboriginal mm -hmm. hands. So jobs dedicated to uh, regenerating and protecting natural environments could help address poverty and marginalisation in communities, and genuine sovereignty could provide a shield against destructive mining and agriculture. I mean, let's face it, Indigenous people manage the land for up to 100,000 years. We've been here barely 200 and we're looking at absolute climate catastrophe. Um, so what better people to teach us how to manage the land and regenerate it than the Aboriginal people themselves? Um, <clears throat> so uh, Socialist Alliance does actually have its own kind of version of a Green New Deal. It's a little dated, but um, it's, it's online and it offers as I said, a, a lot of the um, information I took here from um, all the other industries, it offers social solutions to, um, yeah, to Green New Deal. <laughs> um, so how do we get there? And this is a rough, as I said, at the beginning of the talk, what we're, what we're facing, what we're coming up against. Um, we know that the powerful ruling class are not going to give up their wealth easily. Um, any Green New Deal here will be met with resistance from the capitalist class who are hostile to even the most modest measures to avoid ecological collapse. Given that they cannot be voted out, you know, Labor and Liberal are no different. I mean, whatever Labor are talking about bringing up a Green New Deal, but we can imagine what, what that would look like. <laughs> um, so given that they cannot be voted out, and most in Australia are not ready or armed for a complete revolution, uh, the only plausible action is a mass movement of an informed, mobilised community that can confront, challenge and displace them. The campaign must happen in the streets, schools, universities and workplaces with a base in the trade union movement. I mean, those who produce society's wealth have the power to halt that production of wealth. It's the, it's the trade union. We've got to tear the trade unions away from labour, pretty much. Um, we need to build solidarity amongst leftists, activists and unionists to form a new political movement that can fight for a socialist Green New Deal. Solidarity must be built in a society that has been made scared and divided by very conscious attacks on our freedoms to organise, to protest, um, attacks on our community spaces in which to gather and to trust in each other. We have to provide hope and educate people to show that there is a better way of living, where we as a society share resources rather than hoard and profit off them. The climate crisis has awakened a whole new consciousness, a rapidly evolving desire for a new system. Um, and we can see this in the, the student movement, um, which as Dirk pointed out, and as Rob pointed out, ha is having um, an effect. And any of you who went to the, um, any of the protests here in Perth, I mean, 10,000 people on the streets of Perth is a, is a, is a pretty amazing thing. Um, <coughs> so there is this growing knowledge in the world of what people power can achieve. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing all over the world, in Iran, uh, Bolivia, Chile, people are taking the street, rising up against governments that are purely about making profit for that small, tiny, tiny few, and people are rising up. So an empowered, mobilised mass of united people that vastly outnumbers the ruling class could win back our democratic power to force a Green New Deal. But we need to be united against the capitalist market any new deal must be socialist in nature to stop climate destruction and deliver quality of life to more than just the 1%. We need to change the system, not the climate. <laughs> Hope. So I can take a call list for us here living in the um wow. belly, belly of the beast. Um, okay, that was a great contribution. So what I'll do is I'll just take take to the questions and contributions of people. Try to keep it to it say about three minutes um, so everyone, everyone gets a go. Um, I'll take like three at a time and see if the panelists want to re want to respond and then we'll take another another three. So just sort of I'm going to stick your head up if you'd like to. Let me just ask a question of Katrina. Those um, uh, L&D statistics, 
Is that exploration only or does that include the, the burning of the gas in other countries? Um, no, it includes the... It seems a little high. Sorry? It seems high for exploration only. No, it's not exploration only, that's, that's also... Includes um, the burning of the gas in Japan and China? Um, no, it's not includes the, the burning in other countries, it includes the export. So, so what, what we dig up here and then... So you're talking about exploration, exploration yeah. course, transportation, what we burn ourselves here? Yeah. I might just sort of chuck some clarification on that one. So, yeah, the, the, the CO2 associated with the burning of, of the coal gas we export, that, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But the, the, that increase in emissions of Australia's emissions, WA's emissions that Katrina was talking about, that's, just, that's from the production of LNG. So just the very production of LNG, there's a lot of CO2 produced in the production of LNG. Uh, and then there's also what's called fugitive emissions of methane, mm -hmm. uh, which of course is 22 times, is it, 22 times, yeah. 22 times more powerful, uh, uh, sorry, 72 times more powerful to greenhouse gas within about, I think, a 22 year time frame. Um, I mean, so methane does break down in the environment, um, but while it's around, it's extremely potent. Um, so you only need to have, you know, two, three percent leakage in the production train. Um, so, you, so you have the methane emissions, then the CO2 that's required to actually produce the LNG. Um, then there's the transport of the LNG, and then there's that burning of the LNG at, at actual destination point. By the time you add all those things together, um, gas is, as Patrina said, is yeah. as bad. I'll, I'll put the website not, up on here if you want, because it does than, a, the report does a complete oh. breakdown of the okay, um, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. It's, all, so it's all online under cleanstate.org.au. So yeah, I mean, LNG is, LNG, it's only one third of the emissions of coal at the point where it's burnt. Yeah. But over coal production plants. So anyway, we've got um, Paul and Chris. Paul. Um, my concern is about the practicality of some of these things that, um, that in order, so the, the, the general themes coming from all, all three of our speakers <coughs> really highlights revolution, a socialist revolution. And, you know, when we look at the revolutions that have occurred in the world along similar lines, they've been awful. You know, they, they've been bloody, They've been um, enduring, and um, and although they brought about change, it, it, it's been done in a in, in many ways in the vilest of ways, and so my question then is is then. How can we bring about a calm, thoughtful um, re revolution? Because that, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and for me, it doesn't seem a possibility. So, it, if that isn't a possibility, then how do we transition in, a, in an evolutionary way rather than a revolutionary? Paul, I'm sure that's that question that's will the, provide that one question. That's <laughs> fertile, fertile um, ground for, for, for lots of discussion. Chris? Yeah, I do apologize because my thoughts are a bit of a jumble, so I'm going to probably just go all over the place. I mean, on that last point, I think the last attempt to do a peaceful transition towards socialism was probably under Salvador Allende in, in Chile in 73, um, where he was going to great lengths to try to keep you know the business community on side, the emergency community on side, and the military on side, and he ended up being bombed out of the presidential palace by a U.S. jet plane. Um, I think it is fair to say that um, in the Marxist tradition, we say that history is the continuation of the class struggle between the haves and the have-nots, and revolutions have been violent because those in positions of power have always been super reluctant to release their hold on on their privileges. Um, against the express democratic wishes of, you know, the people beneath them. Um, how, I mean, I think, you know, revolutionary movements are made up of people who desperately want better rights for everybody, but recognizing that those people in power now um, are not gonna accept that. 
Um, and there is an unfortunate reality where around the world people are taking to the streets and being put down by armies and the rest of them. People, in, people are seeing situations in Hong Kong right now where you know, there's direct physical confrontation between protesters and, and the police. Um, with protests that started off entirely peaceful, but people have got to this point because of the response that they you know, had meted out to them. Um, just in terms of um, sort of the motivational points that people have made, and Ellen and I were talking about this before the meeting started, where, particularly in the case of the United, uh, in the UK, it does feel like there is more reason for optimism now um, than I can really remember in a long time. And that has a lot to actually galvanize people's in, in enthusiasm in politics, because you need to have something that you really believe in. And I do find that a lot of environmental movements and social movements in Australia are really focusing on what they don't want. Like they arrive at a point where they're anti-capitalist, but you can't move forward with that. What takes you forward is the idea of, well, what would make life better for us and our community and our environment? And that's why it's actually a really exciting conversation to have. Um, but on the point of people having to respond to crisis, I mean, something that came to mind for me is today, at least Havana, I'm not sure about the other cities in Cuba, but 60% to 70% of the food eaten in Havana, the main capital city of Cuba, is grown within the city's center, within the boundary of Cuba. And that didn't come about really by choice, it was in the early 90s when their oil supply was switched off overnight. People starving, you can't then travel out to the countryside to then grow food away from where you live. People started growing food on their front verge, or like vacant plots in their community, which led to an urban permaculture movement, which is now much more environmentally sustainable than otherwise. But people didn't do that before it was necessary, and they had to respond to the crisis that, that came about. Um, I think when people think about what needs to be done for the future in a situation like Australia, they take the status quo and then just add gears to a continuum, like things are static. Um, an example I like to give, and I think I give this every forum we do, is um, Britain in, in World War II, where they were completely unprepared for the war effort that was gonna have to be fought against fascism in Germany. And they took control, state control, over large parts of their economy and said, you are now producing tank wheels. You are now doing this. Everything is now geared towards this crisis that we face in the here and the now. And recognizing the environmental crisis being much more than any war between nations, um, the idea of that we can rapidly mobilize society to take community control of the economy to then make that happen isn't a far-fetched thing. Um, you see communities that come together in the midst of a fire, you know, bushfire. Communities change, people change and you start building that capacity as, as a community. I don't think it's gonna be nice. I don't think any of this is gonna be nice. Um, I feel like we're gonna be facing a real desperate situation as a global humanity to make this happen, but what we need to be doing now in the time that we have is to be putting forward with really positive, but practical solutions that do exist, because without those, people are going to get, like, get swamped in their fears and their anxieties, and that's where internal program and violence is gonna really play out. So what Australia re needs right now, and WA needs right now, is the most confident, practical, worked out plan and, and ideas as to how society can change. Mm -hmm. I can comment myself on my brother, so I'll, I'll um, you know, Barry, was that you over there, Bill, I think? Um, so I just, I just wanted to briefly respond to Paul's comment, um, and then make a couple other ones. I think one of the challenges we have, Paul, is that um, no ruling class in history has ever voluntarily given up its power and privilege, and no ruling class ever will. You know, that, I mean, that, that, that's, that's the problem we, that we have. Um, and I think that is true of the fossil fuel capitalists that rule Australia. Right? You know, these, these people are ruthless, um, utterly ruthless. And um, that, that that doesn't mean you need a whole lot of violence to get rid of them, but it does mean you need a decisive majority. You know, to say, we are the majority, this is what we've democratically decided, and we are gonna do it, and you do not have the right to stop us. And don't you dare threaten violence to stop us. Um, because that, that's what they will do, you know? And it's interesting that, you know, like in the lead up to the last British elections, where Jeremy Corbyn did a lot better than what people anticipated, but there was, there was one that a senior British general who was quoted in the media saying, oh, if Corbyn wins, we'll have to stop him. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, this, I mean, this was, this was about the tacit, tacit admission that the, he was just basically saying, we'll, 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 we'll organise a coup to overthrow the other government. You know, I mean, that, that's, 
I mean, because that's the other part of the thing, you know, if, if, Jeremy, if, if, if Labor gets elected in Britain with this fantastic plan for transition, the fight will be on, you know, because mm -hmm. British capitalists, um, and of course, and sections of the elite in the public service and the military are not, and they're not going to cooperate. They're going to sabotage, sabotage that. You know, they run a furious, frantic campaign in the media, non-stop, day and night. Um, they'll sabotage, they'll literally just not follow orders, not do what they're told. Um, yeah, and they front page of the police in New South Wales saying we yeah. need to instill fear in people. Yeah. Mm. And, and so, I, I, you know, in that sense, to, so to get to, for, 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 for a Corbyn government to be able to implement its program, even if it has, it, you know, this is without even going, <laughs> dealing with the fact that the majority of the Labor MPs are still Blairites and actually support Jeffrey Corbyn, you know, they're close to the Tories in reality, you know, mm. um, than they are to Corbyn. So, but let's say, you, let's say you, you know, Corbyn managed to maintain his majority in Parliament, um, and, and, and had been elected by the, the majority. Yeah, British capitalism is not just going to go, oh, well, gee, we, lo we lost the election, you know, too bad kind of thing. Um, all, all the lectures they give us about being law abiding, they'll chuck that out the window. You know, they won't be interested in the law, you know. Yeah. So that's, so in, in, that, in that scenario, um, you know, a, a Corbyn government to be able to implement its program will have to, will, 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 will need, you know, the active, mobilised support of, of, of the, the community. The community will be sort of, really actively engaged in that. And I think where revolutionary transformations have taken place, the bigger and more decisive that majority of support is, the less chance there is for violence. You know, because there's there's less there's less base of support for the people for, for the people who re resisting change. You know, that's my take on that particular question. We'll, we'll come back to it, Paul, and I'll, I'll take that as no, 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 Paul. No, we've been not. We've been not have, you, I, no, I, let's not have. We can't have back and forth. We'll, we'll, we'll go to the others and then I'll come back to I just want to say I've got to go. Yeah, yeah. No, no, and I sure. warned you about that early on. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and the the speeches have taken very very much longer than we asked for. And you said with your question is that we were too limited. To just a, a couple of minutes. I limited mine to about 30 seconds. I don't know how many minutes this gentleman here spoke for, it was a long time. You just responded to mine with many, many more words than I was able to, and, and now I've got to go. Mm. And um, so it's disappointing for me in that I put forward a difficult question uh, as succinctly as I could so as it wouldn't take up any time, and I'm not being allowed to participate. So. For me, it feels sad because I've got to go. Right? But, you know, well, that's, that's a pity because we'll, we'll, we will come back to, 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 yeah. to, to those things, I'm sure. Um, so before we go to Eileen, then Barry, did anyone on the panel want to take up any of the, those topics? I mean, my only point in response to that question is that the monopoly of violence is held by the state, by the military powers, and exactly to the points made by Sam, violence will come from those opposing these changes, not those who are looking to save their families and save the life of all the planet. Um, I like GST what was a, a massive change in one area of our economics introduced by Howard, and it didn't bring about revolution. So there are different ways of actually doing this. One can bring in a whole policy and try to bring in a whole new Green Deal in one election, and yeah, one would have to do that by revolution. So I said that there must be another way of us having this. We can have a vision about so, what a Green Deal so would I, I be, but how just... do we implement it? And it seems to me we've either got your choice, which is revolution, and I'm saying I don't think that'll work. You know, so I, I don't think that I've put them. forward a mention of revolution. I was talking about how people have joined actual member democratic institutes within America. We have AOC, all other members who are joining actual positions of society's decision-making authority with support of their communities in a non-violent way to propose change to the government. I don't think we're looking at a violent revolution here. I think we're looking at a way of implementing policies through the state government powers in a non-violent manner, which will of course be responded to in violence by the people who own the, the um, fossil fuel industry and the military that serves and utilizes the fossil fuel industry. We don't have the power for violence. The violence will come from those that are already affecting violence on all life on earth through the eco disaster that we're living through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't mentioned the word anybody doing violence. I just said that that had always characterized revolution.
but who is doing the violence is my question. There's always two sides. So when the non-violent peaceful side is saying that we need just transition away from a violent system, which is killing all life on earth, who Kong, is committing the violence? In the Hong Kong situation, they started off peacefully and then started burning cars and smashing windows. Um, you know, so it wasn't just as one-sided as one would like. Yeah, that's because the cops yeah. started doing, you know, I understand. And once that happens, well, it's not All right, folks, we'll stick, stick to our call list. So we've got, we've got Eileen, then Barry. Uh, yeah, I'm just leading on to just to leave the elephant in the room as capitalism. So how can we get through to the cool, structure of the the environment? I'm sorry, I'm not there. Sorry. Uh, the elephant in the room is, is capitalism. Right? How do we get the Green New Deal to the end of capitalism? We've got a fight on our hands straight away. Mm -hmm. Eric. Um, yeah, I've got to say, I've seen Paul perform precisely that same manoeuvre in every yeah. in every meeting I've ever seen him in. Not even, not just here, but everywhere. Anyway, um, uh, how to get past capitalism? My 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 in, my view on all of this is that we need an industrial revolution, which is exactly what Jeremy Corbyn is pointing to. Um, we need a political revolution, which Bernie Sanders is alluding to, but his, his political revolution isn't as radical as the one that we actually need. Um, and we need a social revolution. Um, and I think that, well, here in Australia, the Beyond Zero Emissions Group in Victoria have already mapped out the industrial revolution we, have, we need here in Australia. It, it's there. They've, they've been doing it for years. They've been laying the facts out. They've, they've been designing the new systems that we need. Um, the, the amount of work that they've done is astronomical. It's like an encyclopedia Britannica of the, the, the transition. Um, that's the industrial revolution that we need. Um, the political revolution that we're going to need in Australia is we're going to have to, you know, this is just a minor thing, we're just going to have to reconstruct the entire political structure of Australia. Um, and you know, with the new constitution and all. Um, and the social revolution will come out of all of that ferment that is going to be required for the industrial revolution and the political revolution. That it's the social revolution where we human beings will change ourselves and create a new world. Um, and how do we do that? Well, I think what we do is we raise demands which are completely reasonable because they are absolutely essential. We need a Green New Deal because we need to save life on the planet. It's pretty damn simple, yeah, okay? And anybody who gets in the way of that is just gonna have to be pushed aside. Okay, okay, Twiggy Forest, sorry. We're just gonna have to expropriate you. Um, yeah, it, and that's sort of the way in which it's gonna be done. And now I've just said it in a couple of sentences. It will take years of activity of drawing people into movements where they learn all sorts of lessons, where they lose all sorts of illusions um, and, and develop a new form of consciousness. Um, and that will be, and that's gonna be the, the way in which we'll do it, I, I believe. Are you agree? Yes. No one else, are you gonna go back to the panel with other Can I just one oh, yeah, we'll go for the third one, yeah. Uh, Rob, is it, Rob? Yeah. yeah. The, um, um, I like the Labour manifesto, Jeremy. What's the chance of him winning an election? <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, I, I touched upon this. I said that there was some, um, yeah, a lot of arithmetic against it. Um, Britain's got a first-past-the-post voting system, which means it doesn't have preferences. You just put a cross off to the box of the candidate you want. and. Uh, and that's it, um, unlike Australia. Um, the result of that is that um, the representation of the various parliament, parliamentary parties often doesn't reflect the true percentage of the vote they got. But typically, the larger parties tend to get more seats than they ought to on a 
proportional basis, but the smaller parties like, like the Greens, you know, get far fewer seats. Like I think the Greens got one million votes in the last election in the UK and they only got one seat. Whereas, you know, based on their share of the vote, you know, they should have got about 20 seats or whatever. So that, that, there's that aspect to it. But one of the things I would point to is that the Brexit party headed by the racist Nigel Farage, which claimed to be uh, above two party politics. You know, we're just focused on national sovereignty. You know, we're, we're, we're for the people making up their minds what they want. You know, we're, we're not Tory, we're not Labour. What have they turned around and done? They've said that they will not stand candidates in seats the Conservative Party holds. Mm -hmm. In other words, they will not split the Conservative vote in those seats, which makes it easier for Conservatives, sitting Conservative candidates, to win those particular seats. But of course, the Brexit Party are going to be standing candidates in Labour seats. Mm -hmm. So that will tend to split the working class vote, because a lot of working class people uh, voted in favour of Brexit at the 2016 referendum. Mm -hmm. And Labour is now um, stepping back from its original commitment to implement Brexit. So there's a danger there that votes are going to flow away from Labour to Brexit party in the Labour held seats. So that's, that's a problem. Um, the overall uh, decision by the Labour Party to step back from its 2017 manifesto commitment to implement Brexit and switch to a position which says that um, if we win the election, we will negotiate a new Brexit deal and then we'll put it to another referendum. And the two questions on the ballot paper will be, you know, do you want to remain or do you want our deal? Now, it's rather hard to think that that won't upset a lot of traditional Labour voters in the north of England who voted for Brexit. Mm -hmm. um, the arithmetic is like this. 65% of seats currently held by Labour voted to leave at the referendum. 80% of seats Labour needs to win, to win government, voted to leave. Yeah, so there's that conundrum there. As far as I can see, I just can't see any other way of looking at it. It's led in Labour's saddlebags. And um, some have gone a bit further than that, like Kit Knightley, who is an editor of the Off Guardian website, said that uh, Corbyn had signed his death warrant when he went along with that. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that, but what I'm saying is it's making it a hell of a lot harder for Labour to, to muster a parliamentary majority. That's my view. I do think that what Corbyn has done really well, um, and I'm not as much an expert as Rob here, but in the manifesto, and also what we're seeing in, in a response to Eileen's question um, about bringing the jobs back, about creating local jobs, and also about putting ownership of those jobs into the hands of the people. So that is truly an anti-capitalist perspective, and that really is what we mean by socialism. We mean that the workers own the companies that they work at. That has a very real, thing in our society, they're called cooperatives, they are businesses that are not owned by shareholders, they're owned by the people that work at those businesses. If Corbyn and the Labour Party can continue to do a good job of making people see, because there were genuine reasons why people voted for Brexit, we can't ignore that, we can't ignore what the EU has become, what it's done to the life of people across Europe, what it did to Greece, what it's done to the north of England um, and how it is really just a place where bankers can now just move money however they want and decide who owns what and just cut up countries. If Corbyn can show through the Labour Party's position that whilst we may not go with the Brexit, our deal will show that by staying with, by remaining, we are going to change our means of production. We're going to change the way that we organise our society. We are going to bring jobs to society that were taken from you, which is why you inherently dislike and didn't want the EU. Mm -hmm. I agree, Jake. Could I just add to that, that uh, if Corbyn can swing the focus of attention in the election away from Brexit onto that precise issue, and also the issue of austerity, mm -hmm. Tory austerity, which has basically been crippling entire communities, you know, consigning millions of people basically to poverty, and if he can focus on that Green New Deal, get people looking at that and put
putting Brexit you know, to one side, you know, that's Labor's best chance of winning. But you, you know, can he do it? I guess that's the question. And, you know, what, what role is the media playing? Yeah, etc. Um, yeah, I just wanted to answer Eileen's um, question. I mean, part of it is we have to um, contest the, the propaganda that's put out here. As you said, we, we see the um, connections with the uh, agricultural industry and, and our government. And um, I think if we can make people realise, you know, who the real criminals are, and I know this is an <laughs> age-long problem that we have, but as Chris um, did answer Paul, he <laughs> did like to tweet more. Um, if we're offering practical solutions that we can make people realise, you know, will work, so housing, for example, you know, people want, people want, you know, solutions to the climate crisis. They're well aware that, that we're in it, but the, the current, um, you know, government have people so scared of this idea that if we change the current system, our economy is going to collapse. So we have to answer that way, I guess, with, well, it's not propaganda, it's truth, but almost a propaganda campaign of our own that uh, dispels all these myths that, you know, it, that no other system is possible. Because I guess, because Australia has not seen one and because our government and are involved in imperialistic wars that any socialist attempts anywhere else, you know, we immediately see the capitalist, the imperialist going, they don't, they don't want it to happen. But they spread this rumour, doesn't it, that socialism fails everywhere it goes. But the reason it fails is because the capitalists don't want it to succeed and they take every effort, which is, you know, what, what we're facing. So I think, a, you know, a full-on propaganda campaign of our, all, of our own to dispel these myths and get the truth out there to say that there are viable solutions and it's this handful of tiny, tiny people that are just hoarding all this wealth and we could use that wealth. Like, people say, well, how are we going to pay for all these great green fields? It's like, well, the subsidies alone that we, we give to the fossil fuel industry, you know, if we took that money elsewhere, I mean, how much do we pay in defence? How much do we give to our defence? <coughs> You know, and the reason again people are happy with that is because they've been scared by this whole terrorist thing. We need that, we need our defence force, we need to be protected. Well, we don't actually. It's our current government we need protection from. It's this climate, you know, emergency that we need protection from, and that's where our money should be going. And I guess just making people come to the same consciousness awareness that, that we in this room already have. It's, you know, that's a big part. We don't need guns, we need education, we need knowledge. Truth. And guns. <laughs> and, <laughs> and guns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sorry that I'm, my, I, I did mention revolution and guns, but I was kind of joking. <laughs> I said, I said, you know, we're nowhere near ready for that. And maybe Paul's picked up on that. <clears throat> I, think, I think Paul knew we weren't talking about violent revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll take another three. Uh, Chris, Janet, anyone else? A straw man. I'm going to shoot off this. So thanks very much. That's exactly what it was. The yeah, thing I, I was thinking about raising there, and I think it is um, winning hearts and minds, as Katrina's talking about, is effectively the way in which we win this. Um, it's because it's when minorities and small handfuls of people want to impose themselves on the majority that they use conventional weapons and, and violence. You know, a majority which acts like a majority and organizes the majority is something they have to put down over a very long period of time. Um, to quote Lincoln, <laughs> uh, what is it? You can lie, you can um, fool the majority most some of the time, or some of the time, some of the people all the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. And I think that's really significant, you know, there is a rising consciousness, and I think um, part of it is obviously convincing people that their personal lives and their communities can be made better by the transition that we're talking about. And then move on to the fact of uh, the anti-imperial component of all this, which is recognizing that places in the so-called West, like Australia, United States, and Britain, um, have developed huge hordes of cash because of their exploitation of the, the rest of the world, countries which are underdeveloped and are unable necessarily to produce all their own renewable systems and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then recognizing that as part of this transition, having a global perspective, countries like Australia are gonna have to not only produce the renewable energies and systems to supply this country's own needs, but then to ensure that those technologies and materials provided to other regional countries, either free or at absolutely no cost. And I'm thinking like East Timor, for example. Like, it's actually, East Timor is actually an easier example because <laughs> most people can appreciate that Australia has been flogging East Timor since East Timor has existed um, through its exploitation of the oil supplies in the, in the, in the East Timor Sea, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and recognizing that we have that obligation. And that actually is polar opposite to what Katrina's just mentioned, which is 
the fear and the xenophobia and the fortress mentality that exists in Australia. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be the first thing that we are going to be able to achieve, but it flows on from everything else that we're talking about, and that humanistic consciousness that gets raised in the process. Mm. Thanks so much. I'm going to shoot up. Oh. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that'll work. Uh, Janet. Just a question. Um, is, there, is there any example, whether it be in Australia or the US or the UK, where you see significant union engagement and involvement? In, in supporting this kind of initiative? The US doesn't have unions. I mean, it does, but they're pretty much demolished. Um, so I think that that is a big problem that America needs to resolve. Uh, that's my position the US and unions. In Britain, the unions affiliated to the Labor Party far won the fact the Green New Deal at the Labor Party conference. The uh, DNB union is partially impacted. That, as I mentioned, they've got members in the fossil fuel industry and the nuclear industry. Um, so, yeah, so they're <coughs> partly reflecting, I guess, the fears and the apprehensions of, of their members. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the spokesperson at the conference, as I mentioned, for uh, the, uh, uh, the Labour movement, the Labour Green, New Green, New Deal Green movement, you know, one of their leaders, he was also a very active unionist. So, I, mean, I, I couldn't argue that meant that her union as such was actively backing the deal, but there is quite strong union involvement. And you know, at the conference, the unions have, you know, as a, in the majority, the vast majority, backed it. Yeah. Do we have another one of Jerry? Well, there's no other hands up. Um, I just want to discuss oh, two. Oh, yeah, no, you go first in that one. Yeah, no, you go. I mean, I'm, I'm actually a lot more optimistic than what, what, what we have generally in the room here. Uh, I think uh, there's somebody called Aaron Bastiani who's written a book called Fully Automated Rubbish Through Communism. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, I, and I don't think that's beyond the realms. And I think, I think what, what, what we're talking about is that once we actually get the Green New Deal in place, we don't have the fossil fuel gangsters out there charging us every time we actually want to use it because once we actually get the, new, the green new deal out there and we get the renewable energy we've got actually got energy which actually moves towards a very very small amount if not zero and, and once you have that you can actually start to build and you can start to build things that the human race has never seen before and once you actually link that with a sort of artificial intelligence robotics and uh, in the fully automated luxury communism, they're talking about asteroid mining, which actually means that one asteroid will provide every single person on the planet with literally billions of dollars, billions yeah. of dollars, because of the amount of resource that's there, which means that in terms of what capitalism is doing, it doesn't work anymore. But obviously <coughs> we're not there. Obviously we're not there. <laughs> uh, so, so, so finally, I mean, I, what is significant, I think, about Britain, and I don't think it's been mentioned, is that the Green New Deal is going to be uh, funded by going to the banks and getting very cheap interest rates. That's what we have at the moment. I mean, capitalism at the moment is a system where the rate of profit is in decline, and the capitalists have got all these huge amounts of funds. They're not investing it. So we're seeing very cheap interest rates. And that's what Jeremy Corbyn and the Green New Deal in Britain is going to take advantage of. They're going to go to the banks and bet 250 is like a mortgage. This is what is being explained. So it, it's not that we're going to expropriate anybody. All we're going to do is utilize what's available. And that will actually generate, you know, it will grow the uh, GDP of, of the UK. And it would be a kind of a win-win situation. It will pull everything up. Obviously, uh, there will be expropriation in terms of increased uh, taxes. But the other thing which I don't think we've kind of sort of focused on is that this is a massive opportunity because it, this has to be an international solution. And, and it has to be equitable because, I mean, we've mentioned the capitalist part, but in terms of we want the vast majority of people on our side, which means 
the only way we can do that is if we actually say to people, this is going to be a just transition. Mm -hmm. It's not obviously just in terms of what workers are getting. You know, we have to put workers on side. But for everybody else as well, we're going to, we're going to build homes, etc., etc. And in terms of, for want of a better world, you know, the underdeveloped world, we have had, I mean, we have to allow for the fact that they're underdeveloped world. There's no reason why they shouldn't be developed as well, which means that the OECD and countries like Australia have to get, meet, meet their emissions targets a lot earlier than 250, a lot earlier than even 230, because you can't expect the rest of humanity not to want to, to move on. So, so we have to meet our targets really very quickly. And to do that, you have to break capitalism, because the only way you're going to do that kind of thing is if you have kind of technological transfer to the rest of the world. This has to be, you know, it's not just, you know, we can't build the wall. It has to be an international transformation. And that, on its own, actually means we have to undermine the very logic of capitalism. Yeah, just to say the comment, I was, two actual comments I was going to chuck in. One was this, just to sort of ask the obvious question, why do we even need, need a Green New Deal? Not why do we need this, the, the measures that were you know, outlined as a possible Green New Deal. The reason I raised that was because, so informally um, during the week, um, Dirk and Patrina and myself um, um, talked about a, a, an article that we, that we shared on Facebook, um, which, um, and the, 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 the positives about this article was, was that it, it, it explained how capitalism can't go green because capitalism is based on endless growth, number one, and number two, because it's always trying to externalise its true cost of production onto the environment and the society and not pay the real cost of production. So the article was good in that sense. Where I think the article went wrong was the author basically had a really sort of, he had a kind of instant coffee vision of socialist revolution, you know? And so the, the, author, the, the author of the article, but he was basically saying, look, we don't, no, we shouldn't fart around with this Green New Deal stuff. You should just be honest with people and say, we need a workers' revolution to overthrow capitalism. You know, <laughs> that's that kind of thing. And look, um, I'll be I'll be delighted if he's proven correct. <laughs> okay. um, but I tend to think that you know, um, um, notwithstanding the fact that I don't think a revolutionary rupture of capitalism has to be violent <laughs> in response to Paul, but nonetheless, I think it's going to take a process. Even even in a re re relatively rapid process, it's going to take a while for people to really get their heads around what that means. And so, I think the advantage of a Green New Deal that is that's direction is implicitly anti-capitalism, but that is spelled out in a way that makes transformation seem entirely just, democratic and reasonable, that working people could go, yeah, that makes sense, I agree with that, I agree with that, I agree with that, I agree with that. Um, and you go, I think the majority of working people will need to go through their own experience of realising that they want that to happen, it's not just enough to vote for it, they're going to have to mobilise to make it happen, to overcome the res resistance of capitalism. And mobilising to implement, implement it to overcome the resistance of, of, of capitalism is a revolution, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, some people are, are, are rely, arrive at kind of socialist kind of consciousness as an academic exercise, but, you know, I think when revolutions happen, it's because it becomes a practical experience that people go through. Mm -hmm. it's a pra it becomes, but it becomes, it's a, pra it actually, it's a pragmatic response to people, the problems in people's lives, you know? And, I, and that's, what, that's what I think is the real value of a, of, of a Green New Deal type you know, that has an anti-capitalist dynamic to it. That, of course, then leads to another point I want to make is that, of course, for a Green New Deal to do that, it has to have an anti-capitalist dynamic. You know? So when we talk about all this, there's different forms of Green New Deal being, being battened around, that's a, that's, a, that's a crucial yardstick that we have to, you know, and so the British, the British one is really exciting on that level, you know, um, the, the, the British Labour programme. Um, because I say that because Number one, because of the growing, growing awareness about the climate crisis, and also because there's talk about the Green New Deal, now everyone's starting to talk about Green New Deal. So even the Labor Party is starting to talk, talk about a Green New Deal. You know? And we can, I think we know perfectly well what a, Green New, a Labor Green New Deal would look like. That'll be an attempt to try and convince us that capitalism can go green. You know? um, and I mean, in the context of Western Australia, I mean, so Mark McGowan has said, has said you know, Labor supports a net zero emissions economy by 2050. You know, like, 20 years too late. Um, what, in, but is right now, 
accelerating, <laughs> increasing our emissions. So, so, so you know, a, a Labour Party Green New Deal will be an attempt to bullshit people and have it both ways to say, oh, we, we're we we're really concerned. We love Greta. Greta's so cool. Oh, but we still need to. We still need to just ramp up the fucking gas. You know, that that's that. Uh, you know, a Labour Party Green New Deal will attempt to do that. You can take that for, take that as a given. The Green Party is also starting to talk about a Green New Deal now as well. And I, based on the kind of the balance, the political balances of forces inside the Greens at the moment, I, I reckon if the Greens were to come up with a Green New Deal today, the problem with it would not be what it says. I don't think there'd be much in it that you disagree with, but it just wouldn't go far enough. Mm -hmm. What it doesn't say is that it wouldn't, it wouldn't really grasp the mint nettle uh, in terms of the fact that there's significant sectors of the economy we need to. Sh we need to progressively shift into democratic public ownership yeah. to be able to make a just transition. It will dodge that question, you know? That I think that would be, the, you know? I mean, once again, I'm happy to be proven wrong, you know? So that's where I think for Socialists in Australia, I mean, one of the things we're gonna be talking about in, in Socialist Alliance at our conference in December is, is launching, a, a, you know, getting our document up to date and, and, and launching a new thing, which we tentatively call the sort of Green Left Eco-Socialist Manifesto. So that would be sort of our attempt to say, look, these are the things that, again, that would need to be in a green, an Australian Green New Deal if it's going to be fed income and actually do, do what is, is, is required, you know? And also to pick up Alan's point, how to do it in a way which makes people think, yeah, cool, this is great, this is going to make my life better, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll have more leisure time, I'll have a better life, you know, and lots of stuff. And I think you raised a good point, Alan, too, that it has to be based on repaying the debt of colonialism so that. Um, the country, you know, so-called developing countries can industrialise, but not following the path to industrialisation the Western countries took, which we know was so environmentally destructive. But yeah, you know, people in Bangladesh have a right to their electricity, you know. Um, so that it does actually mean that wealthy countries need to, you know, developing countries need, are going to have to be given a bit more latitude in terms of emissions. Um, you know, e even if they do it a whole lot better than how we did it, you know, they're still going to need a bit more latitude. Um, so it actually means that rich countries actually have to have steeper, you know, more aggressive reduction targets than developing country countries. That's actually the fair way of, of doing it, you know, which in Australia you tend to get the opposite. You know, you know, go, oh, you know, what, about, what about India, you know, blah, 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 this is such a yeah. I'll, I'll finish on that point. Um, because we might wrap up pretty soon, so we'll take another, so we'll go, um, Barry, 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 and then Alan, anyone else? And then the panel if they want to. Okay, I just want to talk about the possibility of a Labour victory in the UK. Um, I was talking to Alan about this on the train, but um, I get um, daily uh, emails from Momentum in the UK, which is the sort of Jeremy Corbyn grouping within the British Labour Party. And um, one thing that they pointed out a couple of weeks ago was um, the British Labour Party now has half a million members, right? And they pointed out that if every member of the British Labour Party just spoke to 100 people during the election campaign, they would speak to every single voter in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> but if they can influence people, if they put their minds to it. Yeah. Uh, and Momentum has been mobilising people. And they've got some super secret, I don't know, some, some um, Facebook al algorithm they've been advertising all over the place. And just in the last week, through that, they have recruited uh, 59,000 new young members of the British Labour Party who they have convinced <coughs> to um, get on the electoral roll, which is a big issue in the UK, getting young people to actually register to vote and then to vote. And these 59,000 people, young people, are in uh, marginal electorates. Um, and this email just pointed out that in the last election they only, they only lost the election by a couple of thousand votes. Um, so by, <laughs> I mean, I think they've actually got a pretty damn good chance. It looks to me like they are mobilising like crazy. Um, they've, they've just activated their networks and they're authorising people to, um, they're not, they're telling people don't wait for the, the Labour Party head office to organise you to go out and door knock. They say, here's the material, organise your neighbours, get out there and door knock. So they're getting people totally decentralised, just going out and doing the job. Good. I think they I think it's gonna be bloody great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so I, I just have a question, I've got the question 
if, but I mean, do you think if we had a, a red green coalition based on addressing climate change for a Green New Deal, do you think we could do that? I pulling most of the left from the, the Greens together, plus the socialists, plus activists. Do you think we could do, could do that? Why? Well, I always keep saying if we could tear the unions away from bloody Labour, <laughs> yeah. have a coalition with the unions, the socialists, the Greens, you know, that, that's where we have to, because I guess the power with the unions is obviously, you know, we don't need guns if they could just um, take away their labour, they yeah. could stop all these industries, if they just, you know, down tools and say, fuck you, unless we're going to go green, we're not, you know, we're not working for you anymore. That, that's, that's where the power lies, but we have to, I guess, historically, Labor still believes that, I mean, you, the unions still believe that, you know, Labor is, is the way to make change, whereas, you know, we can see that Labor's values are mm. not about that. Mm. Anyone else? Yeah, I just want to point out, I am actually very optimistic. Um, I'm excited. I think that, like, as a constituent of the young people, um, we are excited. I think that we have been pretty miserable um, and didn't really see a way forward. Uh, that was sort of, that, that's what I would basically say 2010 to 2020 sort of was for us. Um, and, and, and I arrived at socialism through the eco-catastrophe because I had to, living in New York City, I remember just saying to my shrink one day, like, what are we doing? What are we doing as a species? This is crazy. And he's like, yup. And it turns out he's like an OG commie, but he's just like hiding his power level. And just for, for three years, I just like would go to him every Monday, and be like, Ugh. and he'd be like, oh, you should read this or you should read that. And and yeah, so now through new media, which I think, look, let's not use the word propaganda because it's just a broken word. But new, no, no, look, look, I, it is what it is. New media production and the new media capabilities that come to us through the internet are incredible. And young people are thirsty and they want to see change. And, they, and, and it's not just young people, all people are thirsty, all people want to see change. We need to recognize exactly as labor has, how to utilize these tools. You know, like the whole adage of like, you can't use the master's tools against them. I'm pretty sure you can bash a house with a hammer. So um, let's utilize these tools. I'm really excited about the Socialist Alliance Conference in a few weeks because we're going to be talking about, I like the other word of the clean new deal, you know, but how do we get a really clear idea of what these policies and changes need to have, get our message together, break it up into bite-sized chunks, and then produce the media necessary to distribute that message out and get people on board with what needs to happen so that then we can all together implement that change. So I am I am optimistic and I am excited and I am all for fully automated luxury space gay communism. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That is it. That is. So we're recording this, and this is like you know one small thing. Uh, you know, I'm really appreciative that everyone here is in this room. We need to break this up. We need to turn this into new media, um, and we need to keep having these conversations and getting the word out there. But we can do that, and you know, this is a step in that right. Yeah. Process. Great. Right. That sounds. Did you want have any words to wind up on Rob? Or we? Um, no, not really. I think it's uh, it's all been said. Um, I must admit, I'm a natural pessimist. <laughs> I, I dare not get my, my, my hopes up. I mean, I've been thinking of whether I should you know, tune into the um, so-called uh, BBC World Service, which should go back to its old name, the BBC Empire Service, because it's got amazing <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 or whether I'll just sleep in that morning <laughs> with, with great trepidation, turn on the news at night and <laughs> Maybe I'll give you know, uh, my, my curiosity and tune in the results mm. as soon as I can. We'll see anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I think it's been a really fruitful discussion and helped by some great presentations. The panel was yeah. fantastic. Um, in terms of there'll be some opportunities to talk about, um, we can continue this conversation um, at the Socialist Alliance at the end of the year barbecue. So um, I think it's Saturday the fourteenth or thereabouts. No, no. Seven. Seven. Sorry, yeah, that's seven. <laughs> that's what topics are. So Saturday yeah. seventh. So um, two weeks time, basically, um, at our member Dyer's place. Um, so everyone's welcome to that. Um, and we also have the opportunity to talk to people in general about the need for um, just ecological transition this Wednesday. If you're free, is 
Okay. Mm -hmm. We show a bit of a clip about it. It's the Resource Technology Showcase, which is just basically, well, it's particularly the first day, it will just be this fossil fuel industry. Um, yeah, pat on the back that, that Mark McGowan is, is a speaker. The, the open plenary of this thing, Resource Technology Showcase, is at 10 a.m. on Wednesday at the Perth Convention Centre. And had the open plenary has reps, you know, senior executives from Chevron, Shell, Woodside, plus Mark McGowan. So I think you can be you can be confident you can, and and sadly you can WA. Um, so you can be confident that there will be no greater concentration of evil intent anywhere in the country than at that point, yeah, particular yes. point in time. Um, and I mean that quite literally. That's sort of what the people are planning. So anyway, this, um, we're involved in a um, in a head off ad hoc organising group called Blockade RTS for the climate for climate justice. Um, and so people will be gathering for a protest at the Perth Convention Centre from eight am onwards. Um, School Strike for Climate is gathering at um, at nine am at a forest place and then marching down to join us. Um, and then after that, we're going from March up to George's Terrace to what I call the Death Star, which is this, basically you've got the Chevron and the Woodside HQs just across from each other. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where, we're, where we'll end up. So if you if you can make it on, on Wednesday, um, that would be great. I hope Katrina's got flies for it. Um, and grab a copy of, copy of Green Lab on the way out as well. And join me in thanking the panelists for, for putting some real work some work. Biscuits and we can barely eat them, so uh, have a cup of tea and a biggie, or a beer. Even. <laughs>